I was in a meeting one time planning sermons with a pastor and Diana Mesher, and the pastor said, quote, I hate Easter, and then said, quote, my favorite <laughs> wow. holiday is Halloween, and then Diana Mesher was like, I mean, you can't say that. Yeah, it's a wild thing <laughs> for a Christian You can't say pastor. those things. <laughs> May I suggest, sir, that you're in the wrong industry? You should yeah. go work at Party City. I'm always baffled <laughs> when people are like, oh, it's Christmas again, got to teach the same Things. Can it's we like, leave this in, by the way? Yeah, it's a really good story. Like, it. That's you don't turn on Lord of the Rings and be like, oh, same movie again. <laughs> yeah, you are like, <laughs> I've yeah. never seen Lord of the Rings. I still need to watch it. That's the whole point. Okay. Yeah. You should watch. You should watch Lord of the Rings. How old is your uh, oldest, Raylan? Ten. She. She's probably ready. The for boys love Star Wars. Yeah. Five and three, they're hooked. So uh, they've watched. They watched number three. Did no, you, five and three are their ages. Five Did you just compare ages. Tolkien oh, to okay. George Lucas? I don't know. Oh man, I'm still funky. There you go. It's just like this. You just have a gigantic black spot in your forehead. <laughs> there you go. Well, we did get the Chick Fil A. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank this goodness. is this is that an ordained podcast. In the break. It has a surprising amount of protein in it. You're a good person to be on this because, like, no matter what's going on, you're on your own wavelength. And I <laughs> that sounds like a diss, but it's really not like I actually really relate to that. And I like that. I like that about you. I like that about you, too, Logan. Thanks, guys. I affirm that. I affirm that I receive that. That's a word from the Lord for you today. Well, I just don't have enough attention, so I'm pretty sure that God's giving me a word for someone. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <sighs> yes, I just believe that, like, God is, like, um, he's, like, working, um, like, around um, you. And um, <laughs> there, there, uh, like, there might be a challenge in the next two to five years. <laughs> Um, coming your way, and God will just see you through. Now, spot the difference between that and going to a psychic. Ooh. The difference is the psychics are probably more accurate than that because they're accessing <laughs> demonic information. <laughs> and they make money off of it. And they don't talk in that voice. Yeah. Yeah. Their voice is, like, lower. You seem to be an expert. Uh, I've never been to a psychic. This is what yeah. I assume. Yeah, right. Mystics in general. <laughs> All right. Are we rolling? We've been rolling. This is good stuff. Oh, okay. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us for this podcast. And hopefully we didn't say anything too offensive already. But it'll be hard to be more offensive than Ezekiel chapter 16. <laughs> Am I right, guys? Zippity bobbity boo. You can bring the kids back in. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, because all this is is just a very aggressive riddle. That's it. So you can just obfuscate <laughs> the reality of how intense this truly is. All right, we're cruising through the book. We're making some progress. Mm -hmm. We've now made it through the section of Ezekiel versus blank. We've made it through the anti-fairy tale that turns to fairy tale. It really is. I, I do really like that chapter. I know it's kind of a weird thing to say that you like, but I do really like it. And oh, I, I like the redemption. You do too. I love it. It was, this was the chapter that when I read it, I went, oh, this is why Landon chose to speak through this book. Oh, okay. Ba I really Way back like when. Like, oh, that's what, why. 16? Here it is. 16. The, 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 give me some credit. The last few verses. I was going to say. Totally. Even you have a crazy so view of Landon if you so thought, <laughs> if you read a seek to chapter 16 thought, oh, that's not why he wanted Not verses 1 through 59, <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you the real reason why I chose this book, because it was the one that was the most currently interesting to me, and because I mistakenly thought <laughs> that the adults in, we're, we work at a church uh, in, in Gilbert, uh, Arizona, and I mistakenly thought that the adults in this church were like at a place where the majority of them could study this. And I don't mean that negatively towards them. I didn't understand that the other adult Bible study I taught, all those people had been in that Bible study for 10 years. Mm. So I did Leviticus with them, and they just grabbed onto it. And I thought, oh, great. This is like where the average Christian is at. Oh. Those people were exceptionally well discipled. And mm. um, so I kind of dove into this one, and then I was like, 
might have made a mistake. <laughs> um, open your Bibles to John three sixteen, guys. To John three sixteen. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna study through Philemon. Yeah, Philemon. The book of Philemon is the about. No, that one actually is kind of hard because it's kind of confusing. Yeah. What's the easiest one? John. Portions I from Isaiah. Chosen chosen Psalms is pretty the easy. The easiest yeah. one to market. Like if you ever want to just get people to turn up, just say you're talking about Revelation. Turn up. But that's going to be the hardest one yeah. to teach because everybody has this all this bad knowledge. Totally. You're like, we're teaching on yeah. Revelation. Someone just shows up with a copy of Tribulation <laughs> Force left yeah. behind too. And you're like, okay, we're not <laughs> yeah. studying that. Okay, like, what I, it? I couldn't find on my, where does it say Nikolai Carpathia? <laughs> I, 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 I don't find that anywhere. <laughs> oh, it's such a good joke. I bring my autographed such a good copy joke. of Obama as the Antichrist. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> you have one of those? No, but I'm gonna get one. Oh, yeah. Was say Obama so you're saying that he hard. he signed a, a some sort of trading card and he signed it not with his own name but he as the Antichrist. Six, six, six. Yeah. Six, 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 six oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh that my would be gosh! Worth a lot. That would be worth a lot. You start to learn a lot when you're like in your mid 30s, like I am, and you realize that every single president, someone is saying they're both a Christian and mm. that that person is the Antichrist. Yeah. When you start to see that, you start to kind of get through the like, you don't really need to dive all the way into that every four well, years. Well, every, every president since like the mid 1800s or whenever the Antichrist was invented. Oh, well, the Antichrist is in the Bible. <laughs> nobody so. called George Washington the Antichrist because nobody, nobody thought that. Well, the Antichrist wasn't invented in the 1800s. Yeah, not not I mean, invented, but the idea word, of like that word is literally in, in the Bible. times dispensational. Right. Teeth were wooden. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And his yeah. teeth were wooden. Is that the prophecy of the Antichrist? Yeah, they would never have wooded teeth. <laughs> I think you're talking about. Wait, is it is it George Washington or Thomas Jefferson has wooden teeth? Yeah, why didn't they use a different substance though? Like, I just feel like a lot can go wrong. <laughs> like, what if you're smoking a cigar? Like, your teeth can literally light on fire. Oh, well, there's a dark. And then how do you get question. them out? <laughs> why didn't they use like ivory or like? Mm -hmm. Why didn't they use something Marble? else? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's well documented that, that a lot of, especially the upper class people back then, used the teeth of slaves. Oh no! Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. So then, why were they? Why were his wooden then? Uh, it, was, it was probably a good mix of Aww. wooden, like incisors and real molars. Oh, uh, that's terrible! That's I know. I wouldn't want anyone's teeth in my mouth. Let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> yeah. Say, I like this new us. thing where Logan wants to say something, but he does not want us to respond. <laughs> <laughs> so he just picks up his phone and moves on. So anyways, all right, so let's uh, jump into Ezekiel chapter 17. There is a parable here. Uh, I think there's a lot here for us today. It'll be a bit, a bit quicker, uh, uh, quite a bit shorter, uh, uh, God willing, than chapter 16. You guys feeling good? Feeling good. Feeling great. Feeling good. Um, we got some Chick-fil-A in our bellies. We have the manna of heaven in, in our bellies. <laughs> we are ready. I feel like I'm hovering over this chair. I feel like I ate the meal of angels. We all know that at the wedding supper of the Lamb, we know what the drink will be, which is the wine of the new covenant. Yeah. It has not yet been revealed what the food will be. So big reveal, Chick-fil-A <laughs> spicy strips, which was uh, only available oh, God for a them. limited time and here. And the spicy grilled patty. That was Whoa. so Oh, epic. I don't remember that one. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. So they did the grilled patty, but it was spicy. S yes. Wow. It was so good. It's like they're holding back spicy nuggets <sighs> until their stock price plummets. Mm. They know it. They can do it at any point. And they're just like, why? We're yeah. already winning <laughs> on every level. I think I think there's a shift happening in, in, in fast food and QSR, quick serve restaurants right yes, now. Yes, yes. And that's, they're realizing that they're, they, need, they need to start bringing their prices back down. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're, they're, they're waiting for that as a bridge to reducing prices. Yeah, that's really intriguing because I go to I'd appreciate I, go, that. I go to In and Out and I'm like, it is so inexpensive and so good. Like, why do I ever eat anywhere else except there or home? Yeah, I want to shout out to Del Taco right now because three tacos. I mean, it is Tuesday. On Tuesdays for like, like I can eat an entire meal there for five bucks, 
and, and I then do. die. Meanwhile, I paid. <laughs> <laughs> And then die. Yeah, whoop de doo <laughs> To death. And then immediately schedule a colonoscopy. Yeah. That's funny because most people make kind of like uncomfortable poop jokes after people say something like that. Your joke is way funny. It's way, funnier. Straight it's straight way more straight aggressive and yeah. way funnier. That's not Del Taco, man. Yeah. My wife like hears all of my jokes all the time, so I don't often make her laugh like out loud in church. She also kind of isn't that type of person. She's not like Carly who like bursts into <laughs> laughter spontaneously. Carly? Like, um, but I did one time make Brie laugh out loud in a sermon when I said, yeah, that guy died to death. <laughs> died to death. <laughs> I love that. Was she laughing at your joke or is she laughing that you, that you sort of like did a double entendre? I think it's hard to separate those things yeah, after true. a certain amount of relationship. Well, and let's be honest, after a certain number of years, all your wife does is just laugh at you. Mm. Yeah, and I'm open to that. I love I'm it. very open to being a clown. That's like a ma- that that's, role works for me. Yeah, that's maturity in marriage. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's true. All, All right, right so much. You should be taking notes. Yeah, that's awesome. Especially if your sp- future spouse is watching. She's taking notes too. You're such a She's genuine person, but like your tones of voice don't change when you're being sarcastic <laughs> or genuine. So like I think that doesn't reflect on you in the best way. Like th- if you're watching, he's like one of the sweetest people I've ever met. <laughs> but he says things in the same tone of voice when it's sarcastic or genuine. It's really baffling. It it probably makes uh, the audio listeners super confused. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. All right. Let's jump in. Ezekiel chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, picture of Christ. Propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. Ah, Here's another picture of Christ. How many people are there in the Bible named Son of Man? And how many people are there in the Bible who told parables? Very, very few. How many people are there who have done both? Just Ezekiel and Jesus Christ the Lord. Say this. Thus says the Lord God. A great eagle. Everybody's like, Oh, okay, <laughs> it's not going to be like the last chapter. Yeah. Oh it's my gosh, <laughs> an eagle. Is this an America reference? I was going to say yeah, this is obviously. <laughs> if my people <laughs> who are called by my name, <laughs> it's obviously prophesying the United States of America. <gasps> yeah. I read the book of Nehemiah yesterday. I just can't wait for that border wall. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, clip it. That's a clip, dude. <laughs> Just endless anachronisms. Oh, we did a meme contest, and here was the winner. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good meme. Oh, man. That's a good meme. So well done, Noah. We love you. We believe in you. You got to get on YouTube. A great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors. I love birds, so I like picturing stuff like this. I think that, you know, eagles are, are stunning. I ran a Christian camp in Michigan um, mm. for a couple of years. I helped I helped oversee it, and there was an eagle's nest on the property, and it was so beautiful, and it was protected by national law. It's like one of the few times national law like actually makes life better <laughs> yeah. for the people involved. So you like can't a just bald like, eagle? Yeah, a bald wow. eagle. It's just, you could see its nest. It would fly around sometimes. It was like nationally protected. We couldn't build anything near it. It was awesome, and it's just like such a majestic bird. They're massive, bird. too. They're huge. They're so stunningly beautiful that it could, like literally could make me cry. Um, and this 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 bird, um, God is saying, came to Lebanon and took off the top of the cedar. So just the very top, mm-hmm. like that part in the office where the tree is too big. So they cut off the top. And he <laughs> says, here, Kevin, this could be a good mini tree. <laughs> right. That's that's kind of what it is. Just the top. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. Then he took the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. So obviously that's a good thing, right? The yeah. tree needs water. The, the, the mm-hmm. new sprig needs water. He set it like a willow twig and it sprouted and became a low spreading vine. So it was like a successful transplant of the top of a tree. So it became uh, uh, its branches turned toward him and its roots remained where it stood so it became a vine and produced branches and put out bows. Okay. Then there was another eagle. So this is a different eagle, right? Eagle two. There was another great eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, the vine bent its roots toward him 
and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted that he might water it. It had been planted on a good soil by abundant waters that it may produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. I love this painting. That's awesome. I found it online. It was by a painter who named himself Eagle Flight. That was like his username wherever I found this. And so shout out to him. I love the colors. Um, and I, I think he did a great job of illustrating um, this, this, the, the, the majesty of the wings and plumage of these, of these birds. Um, it sort of makes me think of the eagle on the Mexico flag. Yeah, it does kind of look like that. Yeah, it's cool. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It won't take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it's planted. Then he says this question again. Will it thrive? Won't it utterly wither when the east wind shakes, strikes it, wither away on the bed where it sprouted? So you can see God's viewpoint on what's, what's happened. Then Wait, the wor- can I say uh, something? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, this kind of reminds me of the parable of the scattered seeds. Mm-hmm. And they're both parables. But it's the same yeah. concept, right? What do you think? Wow, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Huh. Like, I think the reason I hadn't thought of it perhaps is because um, Jesus tells us what that parable is about. And I was reading this and I was like, good Lord, what is this about? Oh, okay. So I was trying to figure out and then I couldn't. So then I just looked up a commentary <laughs> and the guy told me and I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah totally. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, I just think verse 10 is so interesting. Yep. It has been planted, but will it thrive? Oh, yeah, you're so right. Yeah. Because like I love that with the, the 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 seed that grows on the rocky soil and it looks good but it's not good, mm-hmm. and the, the 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 good soil also looks good but it is healthy, right? Yeah. Um, say now to this rebellious house, verse twelve. Do you not know what these things mean? This sounds like Christ also. It's a very common move of Jesus to tell a story. And then to ask people, do you understand it? Or for his disciples to say, what does this mean? And then he tells them, or he doesn't. Or for him to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Which is this idea of like, you've heard it, think about it and figure out, you know, what it means. This is a Socratic rhetorical style, which means asking and answering questions to present information. Verse 12 Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took her king and her princes, and brought them to uh, him to Babylon. He took one of the royal offspring, made a covenant with him, putting him under oath, the chief men of the land he had taken away, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up, and keep his covenant that it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? Massive shout out to my wife who brought me this coffee. Literally had the thought in my mind, I would love a coffee. And then she was just at the door with one. Wow. Wow. Amazing. And then all of a sudden while I was reading that verse, I was like, you haven't drank any of your coffee yet. Mm. I should drink some of that. Okay, so Daniel Block um, kind of sums up the... um, uh, what, what's being said here, because um, just like Christ, he, uh, Ezekiel um, gives uh, what, what's happening in the parable, right? So that's what that was. That was obvious, right? Yeah. yeah. So the king of Babylon is the first eagle, and the, uh, the, the eagle came to Jerusalem, which is Lebanon in the story, and removed its king, which is Jehoiakim, which is the crown of the cedar, and moved the king to Babylon. That's to exile, the merchant city in the story. Meanwhile, he installed another member of the royal family, Zedekiah, the seed of the land, on the throne, which is the fertile soil with abundant waters, with the intention that his king should remain submissive. That's the idea of the low vine, submissive, humble. We think of humility often as like a, solely an attitude. In the, in the Bible, it's, it's quite a bit more than that. It's not just like a, a person who comes across as unassuming. It is, it is um, 
a person who is willing to submit to better ideas and, and, and kind of a variety of things like that. Um, instead, Zedekiah re redirected his allegiance, turned its branches and roots to Egypt, the second less impressive eagle, thereby frustrating all of the Babylonian king's aims. So this to us is like, wow, two kings, whatever. These people, these are current leaders, right? Mm -hmm. So the most analogous thing would be like, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, right? Or, or whatever. These are like people that everyone's thinking about. They're in their minds all of the time. And these people are in exile and they went into exile under one of these king's rules, right? So this is a pretty significant grouping of people to these uh, Israelites. And it also um, happens in the book of 2 Kings. So this whole thing happens in twos, a riddle and a parable. The riddle's now and the parable's later. So verse 16, as I live declares the Lord, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant with him he broke, in Babylon he shall die. Which is a, a very um, damning thing to say, because they've been exiled. So everyone wants to come back. Everyone wants the punishment to be over, right? your kid goes to sleep for the night in time out you're like wow that's a long time out right like they just want to come back and play right that's the idea here theodoret of seer said he says know that it's easy uh for me both to humble what is lofty and to raise up what is lowly to make dry what is wet and to manifest what is dry to be in flower so that's just he's expressing a simple idea which is that the attitudes of man could never affect the plans of God. Mm. Um, he can change them. Verse 17, Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war when mounds are cast up and siege walls are built to cut off many lives. He despised the oath in breaking the covenant and behold, he gave his hand and did all these things he shall not escape. So I guess I forgot to put this up when I was talking about this. So that's my bad. <laughs> but that was the thing I was reading before um, from Daniel Block about who is all of the characters. He's just summarizing what Ezekiel himself said. And then here's another thing from Block where he is. Uh, he makes I like I like him a lot. I like the the um, Nicot commentary. Um, that he wrote. I would recommend it to anyone who wants to read endlessly about this book. There's actually two of them. He wrote so much that it took two incredibly large books. They're absolutely brilliant. But he is um, here giving us um, a really effective summary with a graph of what is going on in this chapter. Mm -hmm. The, the um, imaginative fabulous image is what starts. Then the historical interpretation is what we just read. Then the theological interpretation, which is what we're just about to do, then a theological portrayal of the future. So does that make sense? So he's like telling a parable, then he's telling them what it means, then he's leaning into even more theological truth behind it, which is actually a great move for sermon, and then he's moving into the prophetic. So verse 19, Therefore thus says the Lord, as I live, surely it's my oath that he despised, that's Zedekiah, and my covenant that he broke. I will return it on his head. Terrifying. Verse 20. I'll spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare. I'll bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for treachery he has committed against me. And uh, all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword, and the survivors shall be scattered to the wind. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. Here's nine reasons why I'm glad I am not King Zedekiah. <laughs> Those are the things that God said. He's an important historical figure. Here is a summary of the kings of um, Israel the kings of Judah. Um, and I'm going to continue on to the next slide in a second. But just so you can see kind of, you know, I think we have a pretty firm history of, you know, America. We were actually joking about presidents earlier. Oh, yeah. And so I think we have a pretty firm history on stuff like that, right? Like this is the history of the nation of Israel. So um, what you see is uh, the, the, 
G's or the E's are good or evil, and then I think the B's are both. <laughs> if if I remember correctly from when I, I made this a long time ago, um, and so the other is the prophets that were prophesying during the time of these kings. I love charts like this because they help me place some of the stuff in the Old Testament. And then here's the bottom of that chart. And so what you see is, you see that when you get all the way down, it looks like I cut off some of the years on the side. Sorry about that. But when you get all the way down to the bottom with Zedekiah, you see right there, those are the two kings that are most often uh, prophesied about in this book. And um, they are the kings that completely lost. It was an abject disaster. They go on a streak of some bad guys. From Big. Jehoahaz to Hosea leading up to exile. Yeah, the kingdom of, of Israel was was uh, pretty, they had a pretty rough, pretty rough go of it. When Jehu is your best king in the last 200 <laughs> years, who's literally known as bloody Jehu, you're not doing well. What you said something good back there. You were like, we were joking about U.S. presidents earlier. We have like, depending on who you are, somewhat of a comprehensive understanding of like <sighs> the way our presidents have been over the years. They probably had a very strong understanding of their history and their kings. To I, think, I think so. And they're written down, you know, in a national document. Like we don't have an agreed upon American document. We have lots of books from lots of different viewpoints. They had, you know, the <laughs> books of the kings, whether or not those were accepted as scripture or not yet. I, I really I don't know enough about that. But at some point they were. Um, in Second Kings 24, it talks about how Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim was an evil king. He decided to serve Nebuchadnezzar. You can see him up there. Nebuchadnezzar turned on him. He was killed. Jehoiakim was uh, the 18-year-old king. You can see him on the bottom right there. He did about as well as you would expect an 18-year-old to do. And during the <laughs> battle, e. yeah, well, evil and a very short tenure. During the Babylonian siege, she actually flips sides and surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar, which just as a reminder, Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible is a title. It's not a name. So it's not the same guy every time he says that. It's like saying president. Like Pharaoh. Oh, that is very helpful. Okay, good, good, good. I'm glad. Like um, Pharaoh, yeah. Like Pharaoh, exactly. Interesting. Um, what a long title, though. Yeah. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Totally. It's like assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> <laughs> So Nebuchadnezzar takes Jehoiakim and many to exile, and um, he leaves Jehoiakim's uncle to be king. That guy's name was Mataniah, and Nebuchadnezzar changed Mataniah's name to Zedekiah. And you can read about all this stuff in the books of Second in the book of Second Kings if you want. And Zedekiah became king at 21. He was just as evil as the most evil king of Israel, <laughs> um, which means a lot. You know, I don't always want to talk about the murder and child sacrifice and all that stuff, but when the Bible says he was the most evil king, he walked in the ways of his fathers, that is what it means. And Carly, you have the gift of intercession. Will you pray over my computer? It keeps freezing. <laughs> Heavenly Father, make Landon's computer function correctly. Bring the slides to the screen, please, Lord Jesus. That's right. In the name of Jesus. We pray. That's right. Um, so Zedekiah and his family were destroyed, and um, he had like a pretty graphic death. And then it talks about this also in Jeremiah 52. And then, of course, this idea, this key idea in the Bible is that before all of these kings, right, it was prophesied in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God was going to bring about a king, right? So we see all of these kings, and before David became king, it was prophesied there is a king coming. And so when you read the books of kings, you're like, okay, is it this guy? Is it this guy? Hmm. Is it this guy? And it's a disaster every single time, pretty much. There's a couple decent guys in there. And then they're like hoping it's him, right? And then here he is. Zedekiah is the last of the last. And um, the next king of Israel after Zedekiah is Jesus, right? Oh, Literally with over his head, the king of the Jews, right? Over his head on, on the cross. John 18, it says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting Right. My kingdom is not from the world. This is the problem is that everybody thought that he was going to be the next king in this line. 
And he is, literally is in this line, but he's not the king they wanted. He's the spiritual king, not the physical king. Yeah. So back to Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I'll take myself a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and I will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, will plant it. That it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. That in the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And the tree of, trees of the fields shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. Hmm. I dry up the green tree. That's a motif for a thousand years in the Old Testament, the green tree. And I make the dry tree flourish. I'm the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. Right? Like, he's like that guy from Mando, right? He's like, I have, I have spoken. spoken <laughs> right? So this is intriguing. Now, at the end... The new eagle is God. So do you see what he's saying there when he's like, I'm going to break off the top of the tree, right? And you remember that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm going to do that. The sprig um, could literally be translated a special shoot where it says in verse 22, a sprig. I would highlight that red in your Bible if you use colors. Red for Jesus Christ, the Lord. Special shoot which seems to, according to some theologians, derive from a Hebrew word for tender and soft, which is very messianic, like Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23 and 33, Zechariah 3 and 6. The birds are people, the trees are nations. And so is this tree a new version of the tree of life from the Old Testament? You know, symbolic, of course. From the Garden of Eden, um, uh, Block also notes a connection between those two things. Ezekiel's image of a huge tree offering nourishment and protection for all creatures represents a Hebrew version of a widespread ancient myth mythological motif known as the cosmic tree, which sounds like the name of like a Pixar film, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. And there's like a tree and the tree is like talking to people and or like animals and the tree is like, aren't humans bad? All they do is burn us. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, blah, blah, blah. This tree, which is not to be associated with the tree of life in a paradisical garden, is typically portrayed as a huge plant with its crown reaching down into the heavens and its roots going down to the subterranean streams from which it draws its nourishment. I think that the best connection point is Isaiah 11. Um, could you, uh, Carly, could you turn to Isaiah 11? Mm -hmm. And then there's actually, we already have a pretty strong Jesus connection here, but there's actually one of the best Jesus connections in Ezekiel coming still from, from the stuff that happens in this chapter. So I think that'll be pretty um, engaging. Isaiah 11, um, can you read one through five? Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt, a belt around his waist. Oh. So these are continuing um, motifs um, that are showing, of course, um, the, the Redeemer that is coming. And notice that in the, ver the chapter that we're in in Ezekiel, in verse 23, notice that it says... Um, that it becomes a noble cedar. Do you, do you note that? I think that's in verse 23. Yes. It becomes a noble cedar. Well, there's a lot of connections to Jesus here that I think are pretty interesting. Um, 
Eastern Orthodox tradition says that the crosses in Rome were often made of cedar. Mm. So this is the um, literally the same type of wood that God himself prophesies that Jesus um, is. And in a Latin verse, um, we are told that um, the foot of the cross is cedar, the palm holds back the hands, the tall cypress holds the body, the olive in joy is inscribed. So what does that mean? It means that a person commenting in Latin said that often um, a cross would be, uh, the foot of the cross would be made of cedar. They would use palm to hold back the hands. Um, the, the tall um, part would be cypress. And the part that the inscription, King of the Jews, which is what this passage is talking about, would be written in um, the olive wood. Um, so, so, so cedar, the feet, possibly the foot stand, cypress, the body, palm, the arms, and olive, the inscription sign. So, so this person from like an ancient Latin verse is saying that's how they would construct crosses out of four different types of wood. And it's intriguing because um, I see all of these in the Bible passages that are prophetic about Jesus, cedar, cypress, palm and olive we have cedar here in this one psalm 52 8 says but i am like an olive tree a green olive tree in the house of god i trust in the steadfast love of god forever and ever origin took um a fuller angle and said that the cedar was the church uh, which of course does not eliminate the idea of the church as the body because the church is the body of christ mm. Um, consider the sublime grandeur of the Church of Christ to understand that according to the promise of God, the word has been realized. It will become a noble cedar and under it will dwell all kinds of beasts in its shade. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. Take the wings of the word of God and you will be able to repose under this tree that has been planted over a high mountain. So in the Latin verse, do you remember the four types of wood? Cedar, Aww. cypress, Palm, exactly, oh, palm. and palm. olive, exactly. Now, what type of wood did they use in the temple? You know what's interesting? They used all four of those types of wood in the temple. Um, this is the end of it, but I have a whole bunch of it right here. Verse 9, the beams and planks of cedar, timbers of cedar. Verse 15, boards of cypress. Verse 29, figures of cherubim and palm trees verse 31 olive wood and in the last section the last paragraph about the building of the temple they have all four of the pieces of wood that the latin verse says they use to make the cross may the doorposts of olive wood in the form of a square two doors of cypress wood verse 35 he car carved palm trees on them. And verse 36, cedar beams. The main beam of the cross was cedar. And that here is um, a part, of course, of this parable that Jesus is saying here. Um, it's, it's just a very interesting and unique picture. Um, and I don't think it's important if, if you're watching this and you're thinking, okay, I have to figure all this stuff out. That's not true. You don't have to do that. And what I'm not trying to say is that this portion at the end is the main point of the passage. It really isn't. The main point of the passage is that God is going to replant Jesus as the king instead mm -hmm. of these joker kings. That's the point. But I also sometimes find the connection points very, very interesting. It's more of a hat tip. Than, yeah, exactly. Then it is, uh, you need to, like, t you know, take note of this. Yeah, exactly. It's not like if you didn't notice this, you're doing it wrong or anything like that. Right. Um, it, what it is is it's like an interesting analogous point. So the main point of the text is that Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king that these people desperately, desperately needed. And God was giving them a parable. First, he gave them an anti-fairy tale about redemption, and now he's giving them a parable. Does anybody have any mm. thoughts or discussion I, points? Uh, yeah, I 
you know, maybe it's just like the nerd part of me kid that actually read encyclopedias for fun when I was growing up. But I happen to know that the modern day Lebanese flag has a cedar tree on it. And it's very significant, like tree for that part of the world. People like explorers, people, you know, historians all throughout who have, who have visited have marveled at the cedars of Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's interesting to see it mentioned here. Um, and not only that, but like this image of the eagle coming down, picking off the top of a cedar from Lebanon and then planting it. And it says it grows like a willow, which is a different kind of tree. Yeah. And then it spreads out like a vine. Mm. which is something different altogether as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't know it. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but it is like three clearly clear, different images of growth and vegetation there, you know, yeah. a, a very geographically focused cedar tree, which is strong made for building things The, you know, the cross temple, the ark, you know, things mm-hmm. like that planted like a willow, which is a lot more, um, melancholy of a tree you know not not strong but more like shade and shady and dreamy and Mm -hmm. um airy i guess and then growing out like a vine which we literally last chapter is all about or 15 15. i guess is all about vine so i don't know i was just i was i was kind of caught up in that from a yeah um you know if this chapter was a movie it's it's not like michael bay it's more like a24 Ooh. film yeah totally that is cool how it like transforms yeah yeah someone should animate that that would be very cool does anybody else have any other thoughts hmm. but yeah the eagle is obviously america obviously yeah. <laughs> take away <laughs> america Eagles. yeah what's the next america. line <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> very awesome. cool very cool well you can probably tell we're a bit out of gas we've been doing all of these today, as you noticed by our clothes. So we're wearing the same clothes. <laughs> I thought about bringing a change of clothes. I'm not going to lie. And then I thought, how weird would that look? If I'm the only one the only that arm. all of a sudden, here I, I did that am. I did the last you just, time. Yeah, your jacket. I changed my hats. Yes. Oh, that's true. You change your hat and, and all, your jacket. All, uh, yeah, just to point out, like, all these jokers were the same thing <laughs> for two in a row. That's pretty posh of you, Nick. Yeah. Um, do you want to close this up? Absolutely. Like, with with prayer or with a closeout? Ooh. Just, like, kind of like the closeout. Uh, I can do a closeout prayer. Yeah, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> Lord, we pray that these people. Did your computer ever start working? Like, though? I want to yeah, know how. Yeah, it did right away. It did work for hey. the rest of the week. What? what? It did right away. Wow. Praise God. Praise the Testimony. Lord. Wow. I was going to get Praise oils and just that. dunk dunk the computer in the oils. <laughs> now imagine if we were Pentecostal, we couldn't just like be like, wow, that was great. <laughs> Praise God. We'd have to turn it into like the evidence of some massive Yeah, thing. we'd have to get tambourine. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Ding, 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 ding. You guys have no idea. The, the, the computer was on fire before she started praying. The computer was on fire. Okay, well, uh, that wraps up today's episode. Thank you for uh, watching and following along. As always, if you haven't already subscribed, like, share, comment, send to all your friends, send to, send to their friends. Um, and also just want to give a shout out to our brave production crew, Harrison and Panda, yes. uh, for sticking it out with us today. Um, for on behalf of Logan, Landon, and Carly, I'm Nick. We'll see you next week on 1189. Wow.